Hey family, thank you for tuning into Our Roots Podcast with Joseph Babaifa. We're only the strongest roots see the light, brought to you by Botanica Candles and more. And if you haven't had the opportunity, please like this video, share it, and subscribe. So today we're going to be doing an episode on the Orisha Osain. Now, mind you, on this channel, he's been mentioned quite a bit, but we wanted to give him his own podcast episode because he may be one of the most complex Orishas in the whole pantheon. Phil, you've heard about this guy, I'm sure. Yeah, we do talk about uh, Osain a lot, and I thought we may have covered him, but you are correct. We we haven't, and this is this is one that I'm sure a lot of people will get a lot of information and insight on. Yeah, he's definitely one that's a, a point of interest. And when I came out with a video quite some time ago before we actually met, it got a really great response. And I put part one, and, you know, for the past couple of years, people have been like, uh, part two, when? <laughs> So, you know, we're, we're finally uh, fulfilling TBD. that. Yeah, right? So we're, we're finally going to follow through on that and give the people what they want. Can you spell O-Sign? Because whenever I do the captions and it, say, it tries to spell it, it never spells it correctly. So how do you, how's the correct spelling and pronunciation of O-Sign? Yeah, Apple spell check is anti-Yoruba. So Gosh. Um, in Lukumi um, or in the New World, it became O-S-A-I-N. Right. And that's the one we'll probably go with because that's the most popular one in the way it sounds. But in Nigeria, he's known as Osanying, right, which is O-S-A-N-Y-I-N, I believe, something to that degree. Um, so very small, minor uh, grammatical adjustment when he got to the new world, but definitely still the same deity. Osain is a he's a pariah, to say the least. Um, he uh he strikes fear in the heart of, heart of many and interest in the minds of all. Um, this deity, his archetype is present pretty much amongst all um, ATRs. And the reason being is, is because of the importance of the herbs, right? When you read some of the literature we have, especially on the origins of Osain, um, they say Osain is as old as creation itself to a certain degree. It, it even resonates with the idea of when vegetation started extending itself from the ocean onto land. That's really when Osain was born, per se. Um, once on Earth, there's other versions that say, you know, we actually received this mystery from other clans, which I don't necessarily um, digest. But at the same time, it is interesting literature. Um, being that Osain can be found in, once again, all of, at least all of the tribes and clans and spiritualities that were brought to Cuba, um, very heavily within the uh, practice of Mayombe under the nominer, um, Gurufinda. Um, and then, you know, they even say that, you know, a huge part of our literature comes from the Mandinka tribe, right? Um, because Osain was seen as a, a warrior deity. To a certain degree, even though he was associated with the herbs, his rites um, were very intense and usually reserved for, you know, very, you know, red blooded men. Um, but when we look at the scripture of Ifa from a more fundamental standpoint, Osain can be found um, basically descending from heaven, as it's known, or Isaraye, in the Odu of Oshe Niwo, or in Oshe Owonhring, or Oshe Wani. And they say when Osain descended, um, he was pretty normal looking, you know, a pretty agile man, um, you know, and he had to do with the herbs. But um, needless to say, a little bit antisocial. Um, he was somebody that preferred uh, a more reclusive existence, um, especially in the, in the jungle or in the vegetation. That's where he felt most comfortable. Um, and, and they say he had a certain habit of smoking certain leaves, uh, you know, that some people may know the name of. Um, so, you know, needless to say, he kind of did his own thing. Um, but with time, he began to realize that socialization, although uncomfortable, was going to be necessary. Um, and he visited Oromela or the Babalawo, where this uh, Odu was revealed, where it identified that he needed to perform sacrifice, not only of materials, but of good character, or Iwapele, um, to be able to provide for himself, you know. And basically what he started doing was trafficking herbs, um, whether it was the ones for ceremony, the ones for medicine, the ones for leisure, what have you. You know, he was able to at least um, coexist with people on a, uh, a transactional basis, even though it didn't necessarily gratify him. Um, through all of the literature I've read on this gentleman, I've never actually heard of him enjoying an interaction. Um, so Really? Yeah. Wait, he, why? 
Um, I guess, you know, Osaing initially, you know, I think he saw the treachery of man when it came to nature. Ooh, that's a burden. Yeah, because him being embodied by the leaves and things like that, I think he noticed that the mortal man, um, the mortal human, really, you know, basically took and pillaged earth without any really compensation. Man, um, a conundrum, because th- that sounds like, sorry to interrupt you, yeah. that sounds like a villain origin story. <laughs> a what story? A villain origin story. You know, you love oh. you love you love the planet, but humans are here destroying it. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, he was kind of he was he was within and without because you know, he realized that he still needed to interact to be able to survive, but he was so entrenched in his own, you know, geography and his relationship with the plants and especially the birds. Osai has a, a very intricate relationship with the birds as well. Um, you know, he was really antisocial because he didn't trust them. So, you know, he made everything very transactional and very uh, rudimentary. So it would lessen the chances of him being betrayed, even though he was aggressive himself due to the overstimulation that uh, interactions would provide, you know. So it, it speaks of that in the Odu of Oshenewu. Um But Osaing, you know, is more popularly known, unfortunately, for his disfigured characteristics. You know, when most people think of Osaing. They think of this guy um, that had one ear, um, one eye, you know, um, you know, one leg, one arm. You know, he was basically half a man at some point. But he, um, there's a, uh, a small prayer that says, Osain pelese kang meyi hu, Osain pelese kang hu, Osain pelese meyi lo. Which means Osain is more agile on one leg than we are on two. Oh. So there's going to be various stories that speak of the transformation um, of Osain into his more decrepit and popularly seen uh, figure. And probably, at least in Isheshe, one of the Odus and verses that most speaks about this is in the Odu of Baba Ogunameji, where it speaks of where Orumila had a farm. And, um, you know, it was very difficult for him to be able to attend to it between his Ifa work. But he was also trying to be entrepreneurial because he had a very nice plot of land. So he went for divination with other Bawalawos where this Odu was revealed, where Ifa um, told him that he needed to delegate and he needed to have a, a servant or employee um, that would be able to help him attend to his, uh, his parcel. So, but there was one condition that when he went to go buy a slave, it's as it's vulgarly, you know, expressed in the story, that he had to pick the first one that he saw or the first one that was presented to him. Mm. And Orula was like, okay, well, you know, it shouldn't be an issue. He went to a market that he knew had uh, good uh, prospects. And uh, he went and he stood on the, uh, the auctioner's block and You know, the first person that presented itself was a man with a handicap, you know, that actually used a cane. Um, Orumila was really disheartened by this because, you know, the money that he had was going to be utilized on this uh, employee. And um, he really didn't expect much because obviously the guy had um, had some obstacles. But he followed Ifa's advice and he took the gentleman home and left him on uh, some quarters um, where he could, you know, bathe and sleep and whatnot. Um, and Orumila started giving him tasks, right? I need you to cut down this tree. I need you to, I don't know, mow the lawn, feed the goat, whatever, you know, attend to the, uh, to the property, you know, and try to make some income while I'm gone. But time and time again, this, uh, the slave, as he was known, was really providing dissatisfactory work. So Orumila became progressively more and more frustrated with him. Um, but one day... Um, and there's various versions of the story, but um, they say that a very wealthy king, in some versions they say it was actually Olokung, came to Orumila and asked him to help him construct a crown of various feathers and things like that to make a unique piece of work. And um, Orumila really had no knowledge of how to do this, but Olokung was ha- offering a very handsome sum. So, you know, Rumila bit off more than he can chew and made a promise he knew he couldn't fulfill. But, you know, he, he kind of just griped about it until, you know, he, he was thinking he was going to find a solution. But ironically, the slave um, overheard his master's frustration and said, you know, master, I could help you with that. And Rumila was really perplexed because he said, you haven't been able to help me with anything. He said, well, I, I, I haven't done the task you want as well as maybe you want them to be. But I have been, you know, spending time doing what my specialty is. I'm a hunter. And what the guy showed him was various feathers, like very, very exclusive feathers that he had never even seen before. 
And Rumila looked at him and he said, do you think you could turn that into like a crown type thing? He said, absolutely. And um, Osang actually constructed the crown that Orumila sold to Olohun for, let's say, a million dollars, right? Okay. And all of a sudden, the worthless slave became Orumila's partner. And when he revealed himself, he said, my name is Osang. Um, and in that story and sign is where Orumila and Osang actually made the pact. Um, until this day, it's also one of the defining pieces of information why in the new world, the Babalawos are the ones who really distribute that clan or that deity that is Osain because Osain basically indebted himself to Orumila because he knew that with Orumila he was going to be well utilized. And from that day forward, they just started the crown business and they never really had to work much again. And Orumila was always very thankful. And, um, you know, even trying to offer Osain his liberty, Osain didn't want to. He, he wanted to stay with Orula. So, you know, really incredible story and, and a huge message there. And, you know, Osain... When we first hear about him, um, people either think he's being used for witchcraft or, you know, um, he's just overall aggressive or things like that. But it, it, this story is a big, um, a big message of humility where we can't judge people based on how they look. We can't be quick to jump to conclusions about people. We have to get to know people. And we also have to empower people and put people in a position to look great. And that was really Orumila's talent. You know, time and time again, when you look at the scripture, Ifa was always putting people in a position to be succeed, to be successful or great. Um, for example, somebody came, they wanted to be king, they did a bow, they became king at what they were best at. So Osang basically stayed within that role. So, so why, why witchcraft though? Is because of the nature thing? Well, what happens is, is Osang, just like anything, um, can be utilized for negativity. But the thing with Osang is, he's, it's very similar to some of the things you might see um, in the religion of Mayombe. And once again, no misunderstandings here. The religion of Mayombe is beautiful. I hope as many people practice it as possible. But they are very powerful, the icons. And Osang is very similar um, to some of the things you see over there. So being that it's within Ifa, and sometimes the things of Ifa are seen as slow and more uh, routinary as far as getting results, Osang is something that works very fast. Now, mind you, when we talk about plants, um, a plant can be used for positive the same way it can be used for negative. You could save a life or you could kill somebody with one. That's in the Odu of Obarakasika, why all of the plants are not medicine, right? Um, and what happens sometimes is you have some unscrupulous brothers um, being that the cult of Osang within the new world is uh, for, you know, heterosexual men um you know they at times become a little too testosterone ridden or we get a little too aggressive or we're a little too quick to react and we utilize Osang for the wrong things to be frank with you um unfortunately i would say that this deity is probably the most misused along with oro um simply because of how powerful they are and you know how they can be manipulated but obviously i don't re recommend this for anybody because what goes around comes around and you know you're, you're spiritually frustrating a deity to only do negativity at your behest rather than fulfilling his higher self because if you look at the first story you know shen niwo was where osain kind of fell into depression and started becoming aggressive and he wasn't living his truth as opposed to in Ogun Nameji, where he was assisting Orula in doing positive things, whether it was the story of the feathers and the crown or the version of the story where he found the herbs to save the king, you know, it was more of a positive light. So, unfortunately, things that are fast and things that are powerful, kind of like a gun, get misused. You know, you could save somebody, you could hurt somebody with it. So, Osang is, is definitely one of the, I would say, the pistols of Ifa. You know, um, so it's something that really shouldn't be given out with, uh, you know, with with leisure or, or lackadaisic energy. It's something that has to be very highly vetted and something that shouldn't be given to everybody uh, because, you know, there has to be a certain maturity level to give somebody, you know, a weapon or a tool like that. OK, so how do people uh, acknowledge all sign? Um, as far as acknowledgement, once again, it's a pretty closed off um, sect. Um, you know, Osang actually interacts only with his sons, at least in the new world. 
In Nigeria, from what I understand, and I'd love to get some confirmation on this at some point as I delve more in this anthropological investigation that's taken me a lifetime, um, you know, what are the characteristics and qualities of the initiates? But I have heard of people getting crowned in Osain or initiated into the priesthood of Osain in a more conventional Orisha case as opposed to the way we do it over here in the New World where it's uh, more of an auxiliary deity um, for, you know, that very select group. Um, so over there, it's probably much more open, but over here, um, it's very, very closed off and very, very reserved. Um, I myself form a part of that fraternity. Um, I remember I received Osain having like three or four years of Ifa, if I recall. Um, and, uh, you know, as far as being able to attend to him, it's really on the basis of whether you're initiated in him or not. It's not like... A regular deity, like if somebody says, hey, Baba, I want to leave some apples to Shango, I could do it on their behalf. Osang actually doesn't accept offerings from anybody that's not sworn into him. Oh. You know, He protects the wives and children of his sons through him. And um, the reason being is because in the Odu of Iwari Yekun, it speaks of when Osang had a son. And um, the son had some like you know, some turbulence in his home. He wasn't necessarily the best father or husband. Um, and what he would do is he would use Osain as an excuse to go into the jungle and disappear from the problems he had domestically. Well, you know, his wife, um, being suspicious, as she should be, thinking he was being unfaithful, mm. actually followed him into the jungle one night and saw something she wasn't supposed to, rituals to the Orisha Osain. And because of it, Osain punished his son and started giving him qualities that weren't indicative of, you know, his personality, and started making his wife much more testosterone-ridden and, and, and masculine, thus causing a separation and frustration. Um, so this is the reason why, you know, anyone who is not initiated in this deity should never even be in front of it. You know, for example, mine is locked away. No one knows where it is. You know, when I tell, hey, Erica, I'm going to go, you know, interact with him. You know, we close all the blinds like, you know, it's it's completely, completely closed off. Um, and then, you know, there's another instance also in the Odu of Iwari Yekun where Osain was enamored with the Odi Shaoshun. You know, he found her very beautiful. But unfortunately, he wasn't the same dashing, you know, hunter that came down from heaven. At this point, he was, you know, basically dismembered. Um, and he was trying to basically holler at Ochung. And, you know, he came as nature intended. And Ochung, uh, you know, basically insulted his anatomy as being unsatisfactory. Oh, no, really? <laughs> yeah. And she did it in front of everybody. Oshun did that? Oshun is ruthless. Wow. Bro. She's lethal, bro. She's as toxic as it gets. Oh, my bro. gosh. Okay. Mom is on another level, yo. And, um,. She basically embarrassed. Well, she was insulted, too, because he basically exposed himself to her. Yeah, I get it. And <laughs> she, you know, she wasn't flattered or impressed. So, <laughs> Dang. you know, she basically told everybody about Osang's, you know, qualifications. Osang's Osang. Osang's Osang. Yes. And, um, <laughs> you know, he basically disappeared. And he didn't want to interact with anybody, especially women. And that's why he said from this day forward, I never want women to see me and, you know, as nature intended. Um, oh. So it's something that. You know, he only, you know, because, you know, as men, you know, we're not ridiculing each other like that, per se, the same way. We can't destroy each other's ego the same way a woman could destroy a man's ego. Yeah. So, you know, he said, I never want to be around a woman again, and I never want to be in an instance where I can be embarrassed again, you know. So can women crown Osai? Um, In the new world, no, absolutely not. And that's why? Absolutely why, because of what Oshun did. And, um, you know, as such, the sons of Oshun, such as myself, I have noticed that Osain has a little bit of a different interaction with us. You know, I noticed that I, I really don't bother these kind of deities very much, whether it's Oro, whether it's Osain, whether it's any of these, these really temperamental guys. But I notice when I do utilize him for something, he moves at a pace that's um, lightning fast. You know, so I don't know if it's because I'm a child of Oshun. I don't know if it's just the kind of priest that I am and the way, you know, I don't really bother him for much. So when I do, he's kind of like, okay, you got my attention now. But um, it's it's one of those things where you really don't, you don't overindulge these kind of deities. Like I've spoken to brothers that are like, yeah, you know, sighing once a week and this, that, and the third. And, you know, to me, that's pretty unheard of because 
this guy is not something that, you know, he's not like a conventional deity like a Yemaya or an Obatala where, you know, you see them every day, they're in the house. Osain is one of those things, hey, call me when you need me, you know, unless your sign says otherwise. Um, so he's something that's not for the faint of heart in the least bit. And another Orisha that he has a very intrinsic um, relationship with is the Orisha Shango, right? To the point where Shango has a pro, uh, a title that says uh, Shango Olueko Si Osain, right? Or he who owns Osain, or he the owner who calls Osain and makes him appear. Um, these guys had a very love hate relationship, you know. To be frank with you, even though um, Orumila was the owner of Osain. Um, the guy who really, you know, dominated Osang and would tell him what to do, his supervisor was Shango. And when we look at the Odu of Obeirede or Obeade, was where Shango, be, um, Osang became a mercenary, right? And he would do murder for hire, you know, really wow. touching on, you know, his negative aspects if you tell delve into him. You know, you could take a life with this deity. Um, and the problem was is it kind of reminds me of the movie Suicide Squad. What what was the name of um Will Smith's character? Deadshot. Deadshot. Osang was like a deadshot character. Um, but the issue is is you do enough hits, you know, people start realizing who, what, when, where, and they're like, okay, now I have a hundred enemies that are all trying to kill me. So Osang was in a bit of a pickle because, you know, he couldn't handle everybody. So one day he was running through the jungle and he, you know, was running out of breath and Shango saw him and said, uh, what do you run from? He said, well, you know, I've done a lot of evil things, you know, and I may have to pay the consequences for them unless I align with somebody stronger than myself or my enemies. And Shango said, well, um, I'm stronger than all of you combined, you know. And Osang said, well, you know, if you protect me, I'll be your slave. Mm -hmm. He basically made a deal with the devil there, you know. Um, and Shango said, I got you. You know, every time you go and do something, you come running back to me, you pay me my tribute, and I'll make sure you're okay. And, um, you know, they're, they're still on that equation, you know, where Shango is really the one who dominates Osang the same way the flames dominate the leaves, you know. So that's how you kind of see that interaction in nature. So um, the children of Shango by nature, um, especially the brothers who, you know, Oriates, Babalaos, Olorisha, who are qualified, um, they get sworn in pretty easily. I've even heard of literature um, where someone is identified as a, uh, a child of Osang in the hand of Ifa, they would crown them Shango back in the day. Um, once again, not something I necessarily do, but the literature was there, and I can't say that it's wrong, per se. Um, but Osang does have a crowning process, of which I've, I've seen the information, and it's very legitimate. Um, but, you know, that's the way things were done. Um, and Osang... When we look at the history of Osang within Cuba, it's another really incredible story. Um, there was a gentleman. Um, they say his name was Nicolás Sevilla y Naga. And they say he was the first Osang priest in Cuba, right? Now, this is an interesting story just on my background as well, um, Phil, where back in the days when, you know, you'd have an equation, unfortunately, where somebody was owned by a family, they'd have that name. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, my grandmother's name was Carida Isnaga y Cabrera. Right. And her family was from a part of Cuba, Cuba known as Trinidad. And um, they say that that's where this gentleman actually was, um, you know, an indentured servant or a slave. Right. And the story goes that this guy actually, with his knowledge of herbs and powers of Osang and things like that, actually cured um, his owners. Right. Um, the Snagas, which was actually my great grandmother's family. Um, there's even a very well known uh, piece of, um, you know, structure over there known as La Manaca y Naga, which is like a tower, um, things like that. And they say when this gentleman, you know, cured one of the people that, you know, um, he was basically, you know, owned by, they gave him his freedom. And when that happened, he actually formed a. Uh, um, a city or a town in um, Cienfuegos, which is the province right next to it, known as Palmira and nearby Cruces. Um, and all of those people are known as the Isnagas and the Sevillas, right? Which are a very well-known lineage of um, Osain priests. So, you know, I, I don't know. But, um, you know, a couple things I know. I don't know if I'm actually related to these people or not. I've never actually spoken about this on camera before. No, nope. first time. Yeah, but um, it is interesting history and literature because, you know, from what I understand, this gentleman wasn't a Babalao. I could be very wrong. 
but from what I understand, he was completely Osain. And um, his sons, such as Kundo Sevilla, Obedi, Pablo Sevilla, Ofumbile, Nikoko Sevilla, Oyekumeji, these were the preeminent Osain priests on the whole island. To the point where people from Havana, priests from Havana, such as Tata Gaitan, um, Miguel Febles Sodica, you know, these people went to Palmira to get the secrets of Osain that were very different from the ones that made it to Havana, if any, um, to be able to exchange, you know, information and deities to thus grow the fraternity and grow stronger within themselves. So, you know, very interesting history, but Osain goes all the way back to the beginning of the diaspora when, you know, the slaves actually arrived. Um, so... You know, really, really interesting stuff. So I got to do some genealogy there. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, but um, with Osang, you know, we've gone over his relationship with Shango, um, the positive aspects of his relationship with Orumela. There's actually a story where Osang saved the world. And um, in the Odu of Irosumche, which actually speaks quite a bit about him in general, whether it's the story of where Shango lit him on fire. Whoa. um you know, thus burning half of his body, um, or this one. So what happened was, is in the Odu of Irosumche, was where the Iamio Shoronga were basically stealing all of the offerings, especially the blood offerings being given to the Orishas. And the Orishas, little by little, were becoming weaker and weaker and weaker. And as they were becoming weaker, the Iami were becoming stronger, stealing the... Uh, the offerings made to them because the Iamio Shoronga pollute an offering once the blood coagulates. That's why you can't just get a, a, a bag of pig's blood and offer it to an Orisha. There's no life in it, you know? Mm. It's all coagulated. So at that point, you know, the Iami have basically corrupted it. Um, that's why the live animal is sacrificed. We're not so much giving them the blood as much as the energy and the heat within it. That's what really changes things. So... They were basically able to, you know, interject and, and steal the offerings being given to the Orisha. So divination was done, and the Odu of Irosun She was revealed, where Ifa said they needed to make offerings to Osain to be able to find a solution. And Osain, once again, being very antisocial and very, you know, arrogant, was like, oh, you guys need me now. And, um, you know, they explained what was going on, and Osain had this ingenious idea to create somewhat of a lubricant or an intermediary to keep the blood from coagulating, giving the Orishas enough time to be able to consume it. And at this moment is where the Omiero, or Omiero, which means water of the peace, um, first manifested. And it was poured on top of the Orishas, or the Orishas would cover themselves in it, almost like a... I don't know if it's a vaccine or anything like that or a repellent um, so that when the Iami would try to, you know, take the offerings from them, they couldn't coagulate or corrupt the blood because the Omiero would keep it liquefied long enough for the Orishas to be able to consume it. Once this occurred, the Orishas started eating again and nourishing themselves once more and the Iami o Shoronga basically had to be kept at bay until it was their time to receive Ipeche which is the food for the witches, specifically for them to not interrupt the food for the Orishas. So just like that, Osain saved the world. And it's interesting because you look at literature like this and you're like, okay, but how does that apply to modern day life? Well, you know, you look at vaccines, you look at medications, you know, at least in the wholesome sense, they're all derived from some form of plant life. Mm -hmm. Something has to come from nature. Something has to come from outside of our organism and be foreign to our organism to be able to ultimately cure our organism. I actually saw a gentleman named Sad Guru talking about that recently. You know, how, why we're not supposed to consume certain quantities of meat and things like this because ideally within our body we should be introducing things that are foreign or not commonplace to receive all the things we don't have. And, you know, as we look at, you know, uh, let's say a four-legged animal such as a cow, it's much more similar to us than a peanut. But we probably get more benefits from a nutritious standpoint from a peanut than we would a cow with the red meat that rots inside of us, heart disease, cholesterol, blood pressure, you know, all the things that come after, you know, a wonderful steak dinner. Yeah. Um, so Sang is really a... Uh, He's, he's reminiscent of all those things. How, so, you so know, is Osain a vegan? 
<laughs> Absolutely not, bro. That's the funny thing about it. I think he eats more than anybody, you know? <laughs> okay. But, um, and that was another thing. I remember when I was first learning about this deity, they're like, no, he can't eat this. No, he can't eat that. Like, they were trying to put a bunch of taboos. But, you know, I've always been a pretty logical guy. And, um, you know, I really thought about something one day. I said, you know, what animal hasn't died on the jungle floor? Right. None of them. Uh, if a bird dies, he falls to the ground. If an orangutan's walking through there and it's his moment to the ground, a lion, whatever. Every type of animal has passed away in the jungle somehow, even man. Um, so at that point, I quickly realized that Osang is one of those deities that can't really have taboos. Um, there is another interesting story that um, isn't too popular out there. It actually speaks of, um, you know, when Osang actually became enemies with the Orisha Oro. And... You know, when you look at certain Odus, like you look at the Odu of like Irete Wang Wang, it says that Osang and Orung, you know, the person was able to go through the initiatory rites simultaneously, which is not something I would do, but it's, you know, also legitimate. It's in scripture. Um, but there is a story that speaks of why Osang is actually afraid of Oro, right? And what happened was, is after the famous, you know, epic of when Oro tried to kill his brother at Gungun, because he felt like he betrayed him, leaving him in heaven and him partying on earth. And Gungun was running from him, right? And Gungun, running out of breath, ran into the Orisha Osang. And Osang was like, uh, what's the matter? He said, my brother's going to kill me if we don't hide. And um, Osang was like, well, we're friends, so I'm not going to let that happen. So Osang engulfed him in the leaves and things like that and hid him. This is why a Gungun is made out of sticks, by the way. Hmm. Um... And what happened was, is when Oro came into the jungle looking for him as night descended, you know, he was asking the leaves, hey, you know, where's my brother? Where's my brother? Where's my brother? And none of the leaves responded. So Oro took this as an insult from Osang saying, all right, you chose sides. You're with my brother. That's fine. You saved his life. The same way the leaves cover the branches or Gungun's made out of sticks and Osang is leaves. But he says, when night descends upon you, you will never speak again. Because if I hear you, I'll destroy both of you. Oof. That's why we do not pick up herbs when the sun goes down. Because Oro is characteristic of the shadow, the darkness, right? And that's why you can't pick them up until what occurred in the Odu of Obedi when the morning dew fell upon the leaves that the sun was able to reveal and provide. At that point, Osang opened up and Egungun was able to continue his life until night fell again. So I'll never forget my, my uncle Babarito Irete Oba, God bless him. Um, I was learning quite a bit about Osang and Oro, and you know, needless to say, he was a real, especially in Osang, Babarito, Osang and Odo and Oro, Babarito, real animal, like we like to say, real beasts, real, real gentlemen when it comes to those ceremonies. And I remember noticing that he had those two deities separate. And I said, Osang and Oro, you don't keep them together. He's like, no, they hate each other. Odo wants to kill Osang. Osang doesn't even work when he's next to him. And I said, oh, my God, that makes so much sense because I had already seen that story. But one thing is what you read and another thing is what you see. And then when you become a priest or a professional or what have you, you, you kind of try to find the balance between both of these things. Because, you know, you could be a doctor fresh out of medical school, but until you're in an operating room with someone's life in your hands, you don't know what in the book is applicable when. And that's when experience comes in. You know, and um, that's all in the Odu Obewenye, right? Or Obeywori, right? Which ironically comes right before Obedi when, you know, the morning dew happens. So in Obewenye, it speaks of when the darkness descended upon the plants because of this story. And then in Obedi, the day after, or the, the time after, as it's referred to, basically alleviated it so that we could still utilize the plants, even though, you know, certain things had occurred. That's why in reality, you, there's more ceremonies done in conjunction between Egung and Osang than Oro and Osang, which, to be frank with you, I would take them with a grain of salt if I saw them because just knowing that literature. Wow. But Osang, he, he really got cut up, caught up in a bunch of things sometimes that really had nothing to do with him, you know. Um, there's an interesting story um, in my sign as well. The Odu of Irete Suka or Irete Otura says the Ashe of Osang went from Osang to Orula, or the Ache or the blessing of the plants went from Osang to Orula. 
And my Odu is one of the few Odus where you actually see Osang in, um, in fit form, you know, fully formed as a man without the handicaps and things like that. Um, other Odus that speak of it are like Otura Sa as well as Irete Unfa or Irete Oshe. And Osang was a divine hunter. He was one of the hunters of Olodumari, right, or God Almighty. And um, he really prided himself upon being able to hunt any animal um, that he saw. But one day he saw the most beautiful animal he had ever seen, which was an albino deer or a white deer. Oh. And um, right when he was about to let his bow and arrow go, Olodumare opened the clouds and said, you can have every animal except my daughter because it was actually his child. Mm. And Osain looked and said yes, but, you know, Osain, little by little, started becoming obsessive with the idea of not being able to kill one animal. Of course. Right? We want what we can't have. We want what you can't have. So he went to visit Orumila. Divination was performed. Esekan Ola was revealed where Orumila told him, you have to understand in life there's things all of us are not going to achieve. You might do one thing, but I'll never do it, but I'll do something you'll never do or have something you'll never have. You have to understand we're all meant for different things. You have 99% of everything and you can't deal with this one percent you have to work through that and let it go um but osang he couldn't resist you know he didn't perform sacrifice he didn't listen um and one day um out of viciousness he said the hell with it and he shot the bow and arrow killing the deer at that moment the dogs that actually would assist him in his hunting backed away from him because a curse had descended upon the blood of the deer Olo Dumari reappeared, you know, hearing the dogs bark and things like that and, and told Osang, I said, I hope you enjoy the meat because it'll be the last thing you ever eat normally. And when the curse fell upon Osang, he lost an arm, leg, ear, eye, you know, and he had the, the form that he has now where he's basically at the behest of those that utilize him. Why is this story really impactful? Because when I was a young man, um, you know, my mother would take me to school. Um, we lived in BVL, and um, I actually went to school um, in Kissimmee. And um, we used to take this back road. It used to be, God, it was Osceola. It was, was it? No, it wasn't Osceola. It was Town Center, but it used to make a left. I forgot what that is. It's the same uh, street mm -hmm. that Cypress Creek is on. And you would take that up to Osceola to then take that through Meridia all the way to Kissimmee. And um, it used to be all woods back then. Right now, mind you, that the suka is my odu, and you know, one morning we were running late. I think we were going like forty-five, fifty, Phil, and I swear to God, we were going through. We did one of these. Forgive me. We did one of these, and we came back around like that. Mm -hmm. And out of nowhere, it had to be a female because it didn't have any horns or nothing like that. I would imagine it. A deer jumped in front of our car. No way. Yeah, we were going like 40, 40 to fifty on a curve. So you know, my little nine-year-old, ten-year-old mind, I'm like, we're dead. Um, and I've never seen anything like this since the deer jumped in front of the car, but literally in the split second that its hooves touched the, 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 the street, it was on the other side of the, uh, the street already. Like it, it jumped in a way where it didn't even look like the, the, the feet, I guess we'll call it even touched the ground. So now when I do Ifa, you know what, 20 years later, fit 10, 12 years later, better said, and I read the story where the deer almost killed the guy. I'm like, oh, my God, I lived that, you know, because honestly, we, we didn't have the best car. It was small. I mean, if we would have hit that thing, we would have been we would have we would have looked like Osang, basically. So it's just wild, the confirmations you get with time and, you know, just this kind of ominous feeling like, hey, we're, we're still meant to be here um, somehow or some way. So that's how I've interacted. And ironically, it happened in the woods. It wasn't that we were on like I-4 and a deer hopped out of nowhere. We were going through this heavily wooded area, and then out of nowhere, the deer hopped out, you know? So, you know, just, just a wild real-life experience there. That's, you know? oh, man, that's impressive, though. Yeah, it's just the things you see and, and the things you go through within the spirituality that kind of remind you, like, you know, it's around, right? But, um... Let me ask you a question, though. Yeah. So on the level of uh, Orishas when it comes to Osain, you know, you have your top tier, which is, you know, Olo Dumare and... Um, Orula. Mm -hmm. What? What? Where would you put? Where would you rank uh, Osain on the on the pyramid there? Well, here's the thing. Olodumare is beyond Odisha. He's he's the supreme being, right? Okay. I would have to say that Osain is top tier because Osain was there in the beginning. So Odisha is like Olokun, 
Orishas like Osaing, Orishaogo, Agayu, kind of like the Titans before the next generation of deities, which was like Shango, Shung, and even Orula. Osaing was around even before Orumila. Mm. Um, you know, the vegetation was, I mean, our whole our whole religion is completely based on the herbs we're able to harvest. I mean, there's a proverb that says, Kosiewe kosi orisha. If there's no herbs, there's no orisha. So Osaing is beyond top tier. You know, he's 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 first generation. He was one of the first basis and expressions of divine, you know, occurrence. You know what I'm saying? Just you look at a plant, you know, is is nothing short of divine. You know, we put this seed in the ground and it becomes a tree somehow after so many years. So Osain literally there wouldn't be any of the other Orishas without him because all of the Orishas are born from Osain. Without the earth I mean, even if you look at there's this really beautiful ritual or a thing that's done when babies in certain clans are, are born, where as soon as they're born, they dip them in a herb bath. Okay. Completely. To be able to, you know, cleanse any impurities, help preserve, you know, the positive bacteria, all of the benefits that come with it. I mean, that's, that's going all the way back to the dawn of time. You know, you kind of look at human existence and you wonder, how are we giving birth 50,000 years ago? Because now we go to Winnie Palmer you know, we, yep. we get a bunch of shots, you know, they, we, we even give birth in a different position than we did evolutionarily, you know, for so many eons, you know, where women in Africa would actually kneel, you know, as opposed to um, laying down to, you know, have gravity assist them and things like that. Well, sign was present for all those things, because if you go back to the first births and they were dipping the kids in herbs, I mean, he literally, he's everything. I, I even saw a guy on Netflix say that we're all descendants of fungi. Really now? Yeah, so you begin to look at that. And, and he was even saying we're more like fungi than, you know, some of the other elements of nature. So it all kind of goes back to Osain where, you know, he's really the father of, us, uh, father of us all. Because you even look at the evolution of man. Um, initially, we were about agriculture. We were farmers. We were planters. We were harvesters and all these other things. The first things we ever consumed were Osain. You know, the vegetables, the salads, all of these different, you know, the chloroplast, all of these things originally was him. Hmm. So definitely an interesting guy. And, and then, you know, just commonplace things. I mean, obviously his color's green. Um, you know, as far as numbers, I've heard the number nine. I've heard the number 16, 17. It depends on how you're interacting with him at that moment. Um, another interesting point about Osaing is, you know, how did we get to a point to be able to utilize all that he had to offer? Um, Osaing originally was actually a pretty greedy guy. Um, he didn't actually like to share the herbs with the Odishas or if he was going to, he made it very difficult for them or very costly for them because he didn't feel like he did, they deserved them, right? So, you know, this caused a lot of complaining. And the guy who was complaining the most was obviously Shango. Not because Shango was a complainer, but because he used a lot of herbs because, you know, in this stage of his life, he was doing a lot of spiritual work, probably witchcraft. And, um, you know, he needed his materials to be able to make things happen. So the woman that was always hearing him gripe about this was Oya, um, his concubine, his, his, his main lady, right? And, um, you know, she got really tired of hearing him whine. So, forgive me, she asked, you know, where does he keep them? And... Shango said he keeps them in a big gourd, almost like a hanging uh, elk horn plant type thing mm -hmm. um, at the top of the trees. And when Oya looked up, she saw it. And she saw that it was hanging from a rope or something like that that was suspending it. And then she said, I'll fix that real quick. And she actually took her skirt and started flapping it, um, creating like this big gust and caused the whole thing to tip over, right? Mm. When that happened, Eshu, always being in position, this is in the Odu Irosum Che, Eshu always being in position, said, uh, Osang's herb uh, gourd fell. And all of the Orishas came out of the woodwork and just started picking up herbs, 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 herbs. When Osang realized what was going on, he started flipping out and trying to attack everybody. But Olo Dumari said, I can't take away what they've taken for themselves. You'll always be the owner of the herbs, but you have to share. That's why each Orisha has its own herbs, but even with that, all of the herbs still belong to Osang. So... You know, another testament to his character and, you know, the utilization and necessity that we have. Um, you know, there's basically, there's a story for him in every sign. 
in every in every expression, you really can't have an odu bifa without a herb being listed or a story, etc. Um, you know, he's one of the most intrinsic deities, if not the most intrinsic deity that we have. Without him, nothing's possible. Orumila can't perform his function. Eshu can't perform his function. He's that important where really nothing happens without him. Yeah, no, I can see that. You know? So, you know, going back to, you know, his interactions with Orumila, just other stories that have to do with him. Um, in the Odu of Obewenye, or Obeywori, it speaks very heavily of him. It's also one of the Odus where herbs were first used uh, positively or negatively, right? It's where human beings started experimenting with them. And uh, when we read the story, Orumila um, actually was uh, at war with Osang once again, because you're going to see that in various Odus where Osang and Orula were always going back and forth. The Odu Irosunche speaks of it. Irete un tedi. Um, Osang was very jealous of Orula. Because Orumila, apart from, you know, being able-bodied and, um, you know, having a huge clientele base, you know, he, he, he had a lot of things going for him. He was also Olodumari's, you know, preeminent child and all of these different things. So Osang was really frustrated with him, especially being that, you know, he had to basically do what Orula wanted. Um, so one day, um, <laughs> Osang was chasing Orula through the jungle. Um, because Orumila, even though wise, really wasn't good with his hands like that. He couldn't, you know, he couldn't throw down. And Osang was very apt, you know, with his martial arts. And, um, you know, Orumila got to a point where he was getting exhausted. And he's like, dude, I, I can't keep running from this guy. Like, I'm, I'm exhausted. And um, out of nowhere, a woman uh, showed up. And she said, uh, young man, why are you, uh, why are you panting? And he said, well, this guy named Osang is, uh, is trying to kill me. She said, oh, is he? Wow. Um, so what are you going to do? He said, no, I don't know. I, I have nothing to do. I have no weapon. I have no way of defending myself. I'm exhausted, and I think he's going to kill me. And she said, well, you know, I could save you. I could protect you. I can hide you. And he said, well, please do. And she said, well, what's in it for me? He said, well, what do you want? She said, well, be intimate with me. Now, mind you, now mind you this woman... She was much older, you know. The story says she was as old as tree bark. Oh. So, uh, so, you know, Rula, you know, uh, trying to preserve his life, he said, well, uh, I guess, yeah, let's, let's make this happen. And at that moment, you know, um, she, in the form of the leaves and trees and things like that, she engulfed him. And, um, you know, Sain kind of showed up and lost Rula and kind of lost interest in trying to hurt him. And, um, you know, Orula was then released and freed by the woman um, to be able to go on his way. But before separating, he said, you know, who are you? He said, I'm Osang's, she said, I'm Osang's mother, ironically. Oh. So, uh, you know, when Osang heard about this, he hated Orula even more because Orula had fornicated with his mom. Dang. So, you know, it was just a real twist of fate. And Orula said, yeah, you, you can punch me as much as you want, but I'm your stepfather. <sighs> you know what I'm saying? So Jeez, I tell you, you look at some of the literature here and, you know, it's nothing short of a Ricky Lake episode. Yeah. You know, but that that always was a, you know, a really entertaining story to me. That's in the Odu of Obeywori. But really to just show, you know, the constant tension and friction that um, Orumila and Osang always had. You know, um, because Osang was always very frustrated with Orula because he had to listen to Orula because Orula's big brother, Shango, forced him to. You know, in the Odu of Irosunche, which is another very huge Odu with this deity um, we've mentioned a couple times here, it was where, uh, you know, Osang once again was jealous of Orula. And one day the jealousy got to the point where Osang showed up at Orumila's front door and beat him down. Um, Orumila, after coming consci conscious after the, you know, the ground and pound MMA style that, uh, Osang had given him, went to go see his brother Shango. And when Shango saw the state he was in, he said, you know, who did this to you? And he said, Osang. And he said, look, we're going to lay a trap. You're going to have six tiki torches, let's say. And, um, you're going to have him, you're going to taunt him to follow you into the circle. And when you're going out, uh, give me the signal. And I'll make the rest happen. So Osang um, lived in the jungle. Orula knocked on his door, you know, started taunting him. And Osang started chasing him. Now, mind you, Osang was still able-bodied, at least in this story. And when they started running towards, you know, where Shango, you know, instructed Orumila to lay everything down, 
Orula gave the signal as he left the circle and Osang was still in the middle and Shango threw a lightning bolt, you know, kind of igniting all the kerosene and things that he had left there, thus burning Osang in half, basically. Jeez. So, you know, right when Shango was about to kill him, Orula said, hey, let's negotiate with the guy and see what we can get out of him because he is useful, you know. And um, Shango basically placed the terms and said, you know, you do whatever my brother says, you know, at the expense of if you don't, I'll kill you. And um, that's why till this day, Orumila is Osang's owner, but Osang's supervisor is Shango. Mm. Um, so that's why, you know, with that whole family, he's just really frustrated. He kind of reminds me of the elf um, that was owned by Voldemort's family. Oh, man. You, okay, I never watched Harry Potter. So. Um, he he kind of reminds me of that guy. He's well, just, Dobby? No, Dobby was cool. Oh. Dobby was gang, man. Dobby oh. was, you know, he was family, but... um. The other one, I forgot what his name was. He was always yelling mud blood at everybody and everybody was telling him <laughs> to shut up and you know, he was just very, you know, disrespectful. But um that's kind of Osang to me. You know, he was just a very he had been through a lot too, but Osang really is a testament to why we have to have good character. You know, Osang really wasn't very well liked. He was interu- he was interacted with on a very uh a very, you know, transactional basis. Like he wasn't somebody that you know, was going to, you were going to hang out with or have a drink with or spend time with. He was very crotchety and very undesirable, um, you know, and, and you kind of look and the reason being is because, you know, that's, that was the result of his character. No one was ever really around him. And it, it's kind of like, you know, I, I, I know kids before used to play in the woods. I don't know what kids are doing now, but, um, you know, when you go into the jungle or you go into these wooded areas, it's, it's really uncomfortable. You know, you think about prehistoric man and what they had to go through whether it was the mosquitoes, whether it was not having shoes, whether it was a vine getting cut or a poison ivy, or, you know, to all our ancestors who had to die in the process of trying to figure out what was poisonous and what was not, you know, um, the guy who ate the wrong mushroom, you know, it's, it just shows you that our interaction with nature has always been on a very transactional basis because as much as we mistreat nature, nature mistreats us as well, you know, until we've gotten to this point of, you know, modern life where, you know, we're able to, you know, go when we need or not need, you know? So, right. well, yeah, let's, um, let's, let's wrap it up here as we're running out of time here. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah, this one, this episode went by super fast. Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, sighing and you know, there's still so much information, man. Um, but definitely we touched on some stories that we haven't touched on before. Um, you know, just a closing note, um, family, for all the people that are interested in this deity that are eligible on our side of things, please feel free to reach out or, you know, find somebody that's involved. Um, it is a complex ceremony. It is not for the faint of heart. Um, I'm very happy that women don't go through it because it's very painful. Um, but, um, you know, for those that are interested and feel like it could be a part of your repertoire and, you know, can be vetted in a mature way, um, please, you know, seek out your elders, have that conversation. Um, and as we continue to create this dialogue with our brothers on the other side of the world um, to see how it's expressed over there, but just really wanted to make a, a nice podcast episode kind of explaining all the nuances that go into the Lukumi cult that is uh, Osain, right? So closing notes. Um, Wait, before we even get there. Oh, my God. How could I forget? Hey, so That's right. <laughs> we got to talk about the membership program the best part of us you gotta show some love to the people that show love to you if you guys are wondering that right under this video there's a join button you click that there are three separate tiers of uh information that has details on what perks you get so nice let's show some love to our vips we have a new one here this is diane kalagbor thank you so much for joining all right vip jartu thelwell thank you vip sole all about the VIPs. We got VIP Elizabeth. Thank you. And we got to show some love to our super fans. We got Ruben. Oh, thank you, Ruben. We got Baba Oyodele. Thank you. And Katrina Allen. Shout out to the supers. BotanicaCandlesandMore.com is up and running for services and products. The podcast is on all major platforms. Um, guys, subscribers are going up every day. Got to say this again. 20K, man. Really great stuff. Thank by you the so time much. They, I'm putting it out here. By the time they watch this video, we'll be at 30. Oh yeah, it's gonna. It's, it's, <laughs> Let's it's, do it. It's 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 going crazy, man. And um, you know, big thanks from all of us here, Joseph Babai Fab, Botanica Candles, and more Our Roots Podcasts. And until next time, guys, see the light. Oh.